Now, if I drank beer every time I had a cup of tea, I'd be pissed all the time. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about these little guys here. Wheel cylinders. Now, cars with drum brakes on the front use different wheel cylinders in the rear to what disc brake cars do, and the reason for that is because disc drum brakes are more self-energizing in that there's less effort to keep the linings out against the shirt, against the drum than it is to keep the, uh, the pads in towards the disc. So if you have, essentially there's more effort required with the disc to make it work properly. So if you have large cylinders on the back, um, on a disc brake car, you'll swap ends. The back will get too much bias and it'll flick around on you. So they use smaller cylinders in the back than what uh, the drum brake cars do. So I'm gonna stick these on now. I've just got a bit of tape over that um, line there. And I've broken my tripod. It won't go any lower than what it is now. So I've got that little small one the little tripod, um, which is good for under the car and everything, but it's just going to make it a bit harder. It's going to take this nipple off. It's much easier to get these um, to get these in without the nipple on them. And I'll just take that out. It's, on the outside, they look fairly similar, but the inside, the, pist the, the um, piston's actually smaller on the disc brake car. So we'll just whack that in by sort of feeding it through. Oops. And then we'll button it up from the back. Line up. There we go. So before we fit the shoes, there's a couple of things we need to consider. Right now, here are our linings or shoes if you prefer. And there's a couple of things we need to remember with these, and that's that you need to keep. They're the old ones, and that's the handbrake actuator lever. There, we need to keep direction of rotation in mind in the leading shoe which is this one here so you don't want when you put these on you'll get two different um, placements where the friction material is being bonded and you want that toward the front and you want that toward the rear because that's the direction of rotation you can just sort of twist these off against the side of the shoe like that and they'll come out and there should be a wave washer there which somebody who's obviously omitted to put on. I've just put an absolute spot, and when I say a spot, I mean a spot of grease there, just so it swivels easily. This one's marked R for right. So you just put that in. And squeeze him out. Right, we'll put the handbrake cable on. Here's his ways to grab it with a pair of pliers, the end of it. Pull the spring back with side cutters. Just like that, hold them with the side codes, you can just slip this on and let it go. Beautiful, makes it easy with the right tools. Right now, I could have bought a new spring set up for it. I think they're about $45 a side, the new springs and this sort of stuff. One of the main components that wear out is this little cable guide here, and they wear out on that spigot at the back where it goes through the lining. Now what that does is it locates it and keeps it there. When they wear, which they do over time, they drop out and in doing that, take all the tension off the cable so the self-adjusting system doesn't work. In fact, I pulled these apart and found that all redundant, so, um, or all removed I should say, so that uh, they're purely manually adjustable. But we want to put it back the way the manufacturer intended. So in order to do that, we've got a heavier and a light spring so this hooks around, we locate that, and we get this little guy here, put it in, and then that will go toward the top. But before we put the top on, the cable has to go on first. So it's all a bit of a puzzle, like that. And this is where you find out whether the side cutters you've bought are any good, because if they dent in here, or chip, like mine have in the past, it's not much good. These are Nipex ones. And they cost me 70 friggin dollars. So that goes down there to the self adjuster. One thing to keep in mind is these brake adjusters, this has R written on it, which is uh, signifies right hand side. It's actually a left hand thread. So when you think you're undoing it, it's doing it up. And the reason it's like that is when you put a tool in from behind here to adjust it, 
you're essentially flicking it up that way and you want that to expand when it's being turned that way because the other side is different and um, so that needs to be sort of borne in mind when you're putting these things in that you put them the right way around particularly on project cars like this one that have been apart for a year you tend to forget the smaller details but doing this sort of thing this is just the way I reckon it's easiest I'm just going to flick that and I'll put that up on there now <laughs> famous last words get in there you bastard And that should keep that adjusting nicely. Brake adjusting tool in, flick it off the bottom wheel. That's what we want to see. That's cool. Excellent. Well, that's done. So we'll just centralize them. I always run my finger round like this and sort of knock them, knock them in to where they look central, which ends around there. Then we can get our drum on. I am going to have to buy. I've lost one of these things here. I'm going to buy four new ones, and they're pretty easy to replace. I can do that without doing anything else. These are just painted in exhaust paint. Um, I ran out of the other one. I'll put these lovely machine drums on. Adjust them up and bleed them. Right, we've just filled the master cylinder. Doing a bit of gravity bleeding now. And you can see down here, it's all coming up beautifully. So that's just been gravity bleed. We've already done the left-hand rear, so it's just the right-hand rear. And then we'll start, once these lines are charged, we can start uh, bleeding it properly. Right, yeah, pump it up. Shit, is that the Yeah, okay, hold it in. Pump it up. Hold it down. Pump it up. Hold it down. Looks pretty clean. Not a cracker. All right, pump it up again. Perfect. Woohoo! Hello. Oh, uh, stop it. <laughs> oh, again. Yeah, just. Yep. yep. Not a cracker. That's good as gold. How's the pedal feel? Um, it should feel pretty hard. Yeah, it's hard. Cool. Excellent. Now another query I've had is whether or not I've bench bled this cylinder. I always used to bench bleed uh, master cylinders before I fitted them. Now I don't. I find it messy. Um, bench bleeding is pretty easy and you can just use your old lines sort of curved around and put into the cylinder and pump it on the bench and evacuate any air in the cylinder that way. I haven't done it like, like that. I've always just put them in dry the way I've put this in um, or at least I have for the last 15-20 years and um, again not had an issue with it. These are bled. I basically charged all the lines first and went around and bled it again. Um, and I have a beautiful pedal now, and uh, it's it's nice and hard. Now the other thing to bear in mind is when the engine's in and we have power assistance, that pedal's going to drop a little bit, and it might feel a little bit spongy to begin with because we're using new pads and new linings on the back, new discs, everything, and those brakes need to bed in. But what I need to do now, there's water on the floor um, from where I've bled the brakes, so I've neutralised the fluid by using water. So I'm going to go around and check all the unions just to make sure they're nice and dry and there's no fluid on there um, because I have had the system under a lot of pressure now and so we need to make sure that we're all good. Now it's very very important to maintain your brake system effectively. When I pulled this one off the car it was half filled with sludge. The brakes still work fine but the fact is the fluid was well and truly past it. Brake fluid should be replaced every two years in that it's hygroscopic it, um, it soaks up moisture and so you need to make sure it's kept clean and functional and uh, by doing that you're assuring yourself you're going to have a nice reliable braking system. Now this car now has brakes, suspension and steering. Well it hasn't quite got steering. I've actually taken these joints off, these inner tie rods, because I wasn't happy with the fit on the drag link and so I'm waiting on a new pair of them. Once they're on I can put the wheels on and wheel the thing around. I can fit the shockers then um, and the car's actually then ready to receive the engine. So brake fluid by nature is very very corrosive so if you get it on paint and leave it there it's just going to peel it right off and it'll also in affect any of the prior coats underneath primers and etches and all that sort of stuff so if you get it on your paint and neutralize it straight away with water you're safe and you can see here there's some on the ground it's actually gone all milky 
so it's soaked up all the moisture and once it's got water on it it's completely harmless. Just a quick, uh, a quick note about these brakes. It was called into question how I overhauled these using this product, which is PVR rubber grease. Uh, this is castor oil base rubber grease for this purpose. Um, a lot of people have the opinion you have to use brake fluid. You can indeed use brake fluid for them. Um, I've done it a couple of times and find it's a sticky pain in the neck. They're very, very difficult to get the pistons in. Um, and the fact of using uh, G-clamps or multi-grips to push pistons back is an absolute no-no. You're not to do that. Uh, vice grip, that sort of thing is fine to um, to push the piston back with pad changes, but when you're putting the piston in for the first time, you should be able to push them in by hand. If you can't put them in by hand, something's very, very wrong. So uh, just to clean that up, this is the way I've elected to do it, um, and I've conferred with other senior mechanics and they've said the same thing. Well, getting ready to put the engine back in, I've ordered, uh, this is a bottom radiator hose, I've ordered the top one, didn't have one in stock, some stabiliser link bush, it's not going to bother putting that in until I've got the um, the right diameter sort of D bushes, if you know what I mean. That's an oil pressure switch for the engine. Uh, it's got a gauge on it on the engine stand, but in the car it's got a, a light. Um, that's a centrifugal type washer pump, which just mounts onto the firewall. And I lost, or at least I never had. I sold the uh, the old six cylinder one, Borg one at 35. Had the transmission mount on it, so I've had to buy a couple of new bolts. They're great, eh? They're as strong as hell, and they just bang under there. Uh, which hold the cross member on. I've got this cross member all sort of sorted with a new mount on it. Apparently the tail shaft yoke runs a little bit too close to where the handbrake apparatus is. I thought it was to do with the exhaust on the cross member, but it's not. That's what it is. And I'm, well, I've read that the, um, between the transmission extension housing and the mount, there's actually a 3 8 spacer. Um, some people say you have to have them, other people say you don't, so I'm just going to suck and see. If I need one, I'll manufacture one myself. Neutral start switch is on, this is a second hand one, looks a bit manky here, I'm going to have to clean that up, but I sort of rewrapped it. Uh, of course the backing line for the modulator belt. I've got to put a new seal, and these are very reasonable. Uh, a new seal on the back here, that's a, a double seal, it's got the, the sort of oil seal part in there, and also the dust seal for the yoke. Whenever I put seals in, your, you never put them in dry, I've said this before, but you don't use high temperature, well, I always use bearing grease on them, but on these you can't with the transmission because they'll mix with the transmission fluid and cause damage to the clutches. Uh, we use Snow White Petroleum Jelly with transmissions, uh, which is basically like Vaseline. Um, new set of engine mounts, there's one, there's another one in the box. And we've got all our hardware up here, for example the transmission, transmission cross member, that's stuff I had plated ages ago and I can put all that back in. So, we're moving along quite nicely. So I want to take this uh, extension housing seal out. Um, these aren't hard to do in the car, but it's a lot easier to do on the bench, so I'm going to take it out here. I'm just going to try and knock it out. I'm wearing pretty manky gloves, but I can... Um, I have to put new ones on when I go to put a new seal in. I'm just going to try and knock it out a little way. Just give it a few taps to try and dislodge it. It looks like it's been actually belted on the edge, which makes it hard to get this in. And they can be difficult to get out. I'm just going to run a screwdriver down just to dislodge it from the face of the um, extension housing. I can sort of knock it out. I'm on the wrong angle at the moment, but and just work around like that. There we go. Oh. There's a bit of transmission fluid there leaking out. Um, so we'll give that a good clean. I'm just going to give this a bit of a clean with some wax and the grease. There's not much in here, but there's enough to do in here. Just give it a nice wipe. Just get any sort of nonsense out of there. Just so it's really, really clean. Because at the end of the day, we can't put... Normally when I put seals around the outside, I'll put Permatex or one of these sorts of sealing agents on, but I just don't want to put anything on there. I'm going to put it in dry on the outside because um, I don't want anything mixing with the transmission fluid. Now these are apparently this is for a C4 and apparently they're the same as a Borg Warner 35 so I've got to get that in without buckling it which could be quite a challenge. Um, of course that's designed to just protect the outside from any dust and whatnot getting in there but first we need to lubricate that. So with new transmission parts, I always put clean gloves on. We just want to use a bit of Snow White Petroleum Jelly just in there. And we can just sort of 
put it around the inside of the seal. This stuff's harmless with transmission fluid. Um, you don't want to be using any mineral lubricant or grease or anything because uh, it really isn't good for it. You don't want to have a transmission that's slipping and all that sort of stuff. So there we go, that's nicely lubricated. Now on this seal, there's a small hole and a little divot at the top. And we're going to put the divot facing up. And the reason for that is it's opposite where the small hole is. So if there's any seepage past the seal, it'll drain out of that hole um, and not collect in here. So we need to put the seal in like that. Now another reason for the hole under the seal is to stop any suction from this going up and down with suspension or in and out with suspension movement there can be suction created in there which would therefore pull fluid out past the seal and so that hole is going to stop any suction occurring with that little dimple line, I'm going to line it up with the casting mark in the, in the case Whoops. I'm going to try and get it on without mutilating it I just want to start it for now this is going to be a fucking challenge like that we just got to get it in evenly. And of course it'll make a different sound when it seats. That looks pretty good. Of course the next thing you want to do, I'm just going to re... This has got a few marks from the old seal. I'm just going to get a bit of scotch bright and clean this up. We want to resurface this so the seal's got something positive to seal against. We're going to use Scotch Brite. Now, there's different grades of Scotch Brite. There's the green, which is very coarse, and they've got the intermediate stuff here. I'm just going to use the fine. And it's important when we do this not to go this way because we don't want to leave any tracks or anything for oil to travel down. So I'm just going to go around and give it a good wipe over. And another thing that we need to remember is to clean it off. I'm going to use wax and grease remover so it's spotlessly clean because we don't want to introduce any muck into the transmission. And then we just use a bit of Snow White Petroleum Jelly all over it because again we don't want to use bearing grease because it'll foul with the transmission fluid and cause clutch problems and then we can just sort of stick it in like this. And now that's nicely sealed up so when we lift the engine in this can be hanging right down no fluid will come out the back. Take this um, dolly setup I made off. Put the other wheels on. Sell this off. I don't need this anymore. It's just a pity to yourself some money by getting some second hand this is a burgundy one kick panel they're about 120 dollars a set new and you can recolor them and um i mean that was originally a saddle one anyway but they just look so much better when they're recolored and you can save yourself a bit of money doing that i haven't run this thing for months Don't know why I'm bothering checking the oil, it hasn't leaked anyway. Alright, uh, it's good practice to get into. Haven't started the engine for a long time, we're right on the top there, beautiful. Haven't started this in months. Now yeah, the fuel going in the carby. There we go, the fuel pressure. Just crank it and get a bit of oil pressure on. I've got the wrong drive plate on it, it's screaming with the starter. There we go. Let's give it a couple of pumps. Well, the 
other thing that worries me is since I ran it last time, I put these chrome pulleys on and the belt's getting really hot and they're actually noisy. I don't even think they're particularly well in balance. I don't like that. But if you run, if you give it a rev, they're actually getting really hot when you shut the motor down. I'll check them again in a minute. All our vitals are looking good. Just gotta let the thing warm up a bit. I'm just gonna check those belts again. I don't know what the story is, they're just getting, they're getting warm. No, not too bad, they were warmer before, a bit of smoke came off the belt, I don't know, it might be to do with that plating. Oh, that's all right, they've cooled. You can actually see it's spat bits of belt. Um, just in there. And that was a, that's a brand new belt. So, oh, that's hot. And still, I don't think it's damaged then. Well, it looks all right. It's just unusual, I've never seen that before. Oh, that's good. It's up to temperature now, I can start taking it off the stand. People on the back fence are having a party, but I don't give a shit. They have parties every 20 minutes, and I've opened up the back door so they can hear what real music is. First time you drop the oil out of a new engine, it's always a little bit nerve-wracking. Um, just on the off chance that something's gone wrong and you don't know about it, you soon find out when you take the lubricant away. And this sump's about 400 litres, so quite a bit's going to come out, but it'll give me a good insight if anything's wrong. Uh, that's really cool. That's excellent. So it pays to run a filter paper. Run it through a filter paper as well, like a coffee filter type paper, and that'll that'll sharp anything. That's excellent. Happy with that. Another thing you can do is you can actually open this up. That's from the sender. I'm not using that sender. Uh, you can actually open these up and check the paper element inside. Um, but all things considered, this is looking great. I'm, I'm so sort of happy and relieved, if you know what I mean. It's very easy to build an engine and. It runs well, but first oil change tells you a hell of a lot about your work and your luck. Hope you're going to put a new filter on. Just get a bit of oil, go around the seal, and that way you know it's kosher. And not just that, actually make sure the old seals come off because a lot of the time they'll stick against the block. And the other thing that I always see people do, or which I've seen in the past, is over tightening. You only need to tighten it by hand, just like that. So if you over tighten them, you don't do yourself any favours next time you have to take the thing off, because even a filter wrench won't get it off. I'm going to have to fit the um, exhaust manifolds in the car, which I hate doing that, but I'm not sure that the ones I've got are going to fit, so I've just got to get it all ready. Take guess what? What's that? Look at its watch, look how pretty it is. Nice watch. Damn right. Is that that military? Yeah. Yeah, but it's is like, it the French semen? No, no, French semen is next. 
That's a stupid name for a wristwatch. <laughs> I know. I suppose it's um. I like told my teacher. Oh yeah, the next issue is the French seaman because she's like my French, uh, French teacher, not my seaman teacher, my French. Well, teacher. it just means a person that works at sea. It's a, you exactly. know, like a ship's captain or something. I know, but come on. Maybe it doesn't drop. Take Charlie to that party. I could put this here. Oh, I might get a bit of carpet or something to put it on. I've got to take this bell housing off. This is a smaller bell housing um, from a car with 157 tooth, or well, it has a 157 tooth ring gear. So that belongs on Brother John's Mustang. I'm going to take this off. This has been hacked up to fit a, a clapper type starter motor. So I'm going to take this off and fit the bigger one, the 164, for our transmission. When you go to take these off, not a bad idea. Just stick a big screw stick. Look at this one, huge. Stick it in there under the dowel, into the teeth of the ring gear, and you can just lift off. Very important to put this on. This is like a torque ring. It keeps. Um, it distributes load through the drive plate so you don't get sort of stress fractures, that sort of thing. So that has to go back on. Another thing you can do when you take these off, you can see here where this one's been hacked up. This is actually a 164 tooth um, drive plate that someone's cut up to sit on a 157 bell housing. So you also check your rear main. There's a tiny bit of a sweat there, but it's not too bad. It looks all, it looks all really, really good. I'm happy with that. Even the sandwich plate's fairly well date correct. D2AE, 11th, 20th of 11th, 1971. Well, the engine stands looking decidedly naked. The next engine going on that is a 450 horsepower Windsor. I've um, been built for another car, Mustang. Got this car back on its wheels. It does look a little bit stupid. It's very, it's a lot lower than the inch that I thought it would be at the front, and it's too high at the back, so I'm going to have to change back springs or do something with it, but I'm not driving around looking like that. Uh, and the motor, of course. I wanted to get the motor in this in this chapter, but um, I failed. There was just too much I wanted to cover. So in the next video, we're going to stick the motor in, the motor and transmission in, and uh, maybe stick some doors on. See you later.